So tonight, I don't really have new content to teach you. Uh, what we're going to do tomorrow is use momentum conservation in a bunch of different ways. And so I'm just going to do one example tonight of momentum conservation. One, to refresh your memory, and two, to hit a few highlights that we haven't gone over yet. So here's our first example. The diagram below shows two carts on a horizontal, frictionless surface being pushed apart when, compressed, when a compressed spring attached to one of the carts is released. Now let me point out, from reading this part, whoops, from reading this part, my brain actually said, maybe this is kinetic energy and potential energy. Um, so that's where my brain get, went just reading that first little bit. The reason my brain went there is because a spring is mentioned. So I'm thinking maybe we're going to look at spring potential. Let's keep going. Cart A has a mass of 3 kilograms, and cart B has a mass of 5 kilograms. The speed of the cart A is 0.33 meters per second after the spring is released. If the carts are initially at rest, what is the approximate speed of cart B after the spring is released? If I started trying to do this using energy conservation, so let's think about that spring potential energy equation, 1 half k x squared. I don't have a spring constant, and they didn't tell me the displacement of the spring. So there's no way I could find the potential energy of that spring and hope to maybe convert it into kinetic for the two carts. So energy won't work here. Whenever you come across a problem where you're stumped because energy doesn't work, the answer is going to be momentum. And let me give you a little advice that one of my college physics professors gave me. I was trying to solve this really complicated problem using kinetic energy. And he said to me, Ryan, why are you using kinetic energy? Um, seems like momentum would be simpler here. And I said, well, I know that energy in the universe is always conserved. And then he said, now wait a minute. That's true. But you also know that this amount, potential plus kinetic, doesn't have to be conserved. You could have friction. You could have things getting squished. You could have sound. That energy could go into all kinds of things. So this statement does not have to be true. However, there is a statement that must be true, absolutely must be true, and that statement is that momentum at the beginning of a problem equals momentum at the end of a problem, as far as total momentum is concerned. So the total momentum of this two-car system right here has to be constant. Whatever it is at the beginning, it also has to be at the end. And that advice has just stuck with me. Um, whenever I'm looking at a problem and I'm trying to decide should I use energy or should I use momentum, I always just go with momentum. So let me suggest to you, whenever you have this type of problem, and this type of problem is called a collision problem, so whenever two objects are either together initially, this problem says that they're compressed together, so like someone initially holds the two cars together and then lets them go, or whenever two objects hit each other, and either they both move off or one of them moves off after they hit each other, those are all collision problems. Anytime you have a collision, just go with momentum. You might be able to figure out, yeah, potential plus kinetic is conserved here. But let me tell you, there's something deep in the universe, and physicists haven't quite figured out why yet, but there's something in the universe that says momentum must be conserved. In any situation you can come up with, the universe has no choice but for momentum, total momentum, to be conserved. So whenever you've got two objects interacting with each other, their total momentum, whatever it is, must be conserved. While it's not true that potential plus kinetic energy has to be conserved. All right, so now let's actually do this problem. Okay, so the problem says if the two cars are initially at rest, what is the approximate speed of cart B after the spring is released? Well, my mind notices really quickly, ah, keep forgetting to click the pen. My mind notices really quickly that these two cars are at rest initially, which means the initial velocity of both cars, so V1i and V2i, are both zero. Which also lets me know that their momenta will be zero. 
However, in good form, we're going to f do this problem in all the steps that I've told you before. We're going to think about their initial and final momenta. So our initial momentum, pi, must be equal to our final momentum. And I'm emphasizing momentum's a vector because in one of the discussion questions two days ago that tripped people up. Sorry, final momentum at the end. Now, before we go on, think about this. I told you my brain says that the initial momentum is zero. So what must the final momentum be? The final momentum must be zero because the initial total momentum, I gotta get in the habit, sorry, these are total momenta. The initial total momentum is zero. So the final total momentum must be zero. It must, the universe has no choice. If your initial total momentum is zero between two objects, your final must be zero. I mean, deep in the universe says it has to be true. So let's play this out and see what happens. Um, remember I told you there's a don't think part of this problem? This is the don't think part. Just memorize this line, write it every time you're dealing with momentum. M1 V1i plus M2 V2i equals M1 V1f plus M2 V2f. Okay, and now the problem wants to know what is the approximate speed of cart B after the spring is released. Okay, so um, let's call this cart 1 and this one 2. So cart A will have V1s and cart B will have V2s. Now we figured out that their initial velocity for each car is 0, making the total initial momentum 0. So I'm actually just going to go ahead and write that. And then you might think, well, why wouldn't you just put 0 equals 0? Because that doesn't get me to what I want. I want to know what the final velocity over here is. And it doesn't have to be 0. All that matters is that these two quantities add to 0. But it could be that one's positive and one's negative. So now we know that the left side of the equation, total initial momentum is 0. Let's see if we can figure out some things about the final momentum. So we have leftover m1 v1f plus m2 v2f. We are interested in v2f, so let's solve for it. First, I'll subtract the term m1 v1f from both sides. And now my equation looks like this, negative m1 v1f. And because momentum is a vector, this negative is going to mean something. Equals m2 v2f. And we are, of course, finding v2f. So let's divide by m2. And now I've got m1 v1f negative over m2 equals v2f. So let's plug in the numbers now. I'm going to come up to the top to do this. So we called the car on the left m1. So negative 3.0 kilograms times v1f. At the end of the problem, it's moving at 0.33 meters per second. It was still at the beginning, so that must be its final velocity divided by mass of 2, 5 kilograms. Before I do this calculation, there's one thing I didn't think about. I need to decide up in my problem a coordinate system. Let's call to the right positive, meaning that this velocity over here on cart A must be negative. So make that amount negative. I'm leaving in this mistake and not restarting the video because setting up a coordinate system is important and I think if you saw I made a mistake with it, you will remember to do it better than if I just started that way. So I'm calling to the right positive, meaning that this velocity over here for cart A, because it's clearly moving to the left, must be negative. And now let's solve out the problem. And I get my final velocity for car 2 is 0.1 nine, eight meters per second. Real fast, I want to tell you how I realized my mistake with the negatives because it matters. When I did out the math up here before I put in the negative for 0.33 meters per second, 
I got a negative number, meaning that the cars would be moving in the same direction because we know that the left side of our equation was negative, meaning that V1F was going to have something negative about it. So if the cars are both moving in the leftward direction, total momentum couldn't be zero. It wouldn't add to zero if they're going in the same direction. And I know my total momentum must add to zero. And in fact, if you took this number here and plugged it back in for V2F, along with negative 0.33 for V1F, you would find that this side of the equation also adds to zero. It has to, because we started out with zero total momentum. We must end with zero total momentum. It is simply a fact of the universe. If two objects have zero initial momentum, then whatever they do, they got to have zero final momentum as well. It's crazy, but it's true. That's all. See you tomorrow.